is major paradigmic, paradigmic shift from the anthrop anthropocentric worldview to biocentric worldview. It's a biocentric that you are going respecting all creatures alive. And I was really, what is that? That you have to understand, and I will give you the, for instance, WBS, a very famous poem, small short poem, The Lake I Love is Free. And look at this man, says, I arise and go to the Lake I Love is Free. As though he was raising himself like Milton Satan, you see, with his nimbus head, and he was moving himself like a huge juggernaut, you see, and he was moving, and he's, he's, you know, progress was really threatening to nature. Where is he going? To the Lake Isle of Henry. And what is he going there for? He goes there with a kind of plan, civilizing plan in hand, that I will make myself nine rows of beans, and I will milk the, I will milk the honeys, honey from the bees. So he is going there as a colonizer. So if you just look it from Nature's point of view, yes, turns out to be villain. See, not that poet of great admiration. See, he is a uh, he is going there to exploit nature, to really realize his poetic self, realize his poetic self, not for nature, not for the bees, not for the you know for the land soil. He is going to exploit nature to his own end. So this self glorification, self aggrandizement is the mark of all and take another poem take another poem by Coleridge all of you are familiar with that Kubla Khan look at the Kubla Khan is a real place and a tyrant goes there and we are see that he is a tyrannical man he tyrannizes over people and kills people and there he forces a plot of land and converts it into his pleasure dome that becomes another potential point of this entropy. See, it's going to collapse. And we hear in the poem that Kubla Khan can hear his ancestral voices prophesying from the distance, distant time, that you are going to, is going to end up in ruins. You can't, though you have come far away from people for a pleasure dome, this pleasure dome is eventually going to collapse. It will be playing by nature. You know this. Because nature will restore equilibrium one way or the other. See, it will claim. It's a kind of for nature. Always there is a reclamation war goes on. It cannot. You have taken your area, but for a limited time. One day this will be claimed by nature. See, so that is the point of view. And so I was talking about this. Then I will um, um, talk about. Um, I think uh, I, I will finish in this while because I have not much to say. Then you have um, another point of view is um, nature. Uh, yeah. And this poem is very interesting that father was a peasant, son becomes a poet. And we count it as family progress. And the father is doing well, you have done well because you have. Uh, you, you, you have um, leave the plow behind and be, end up in Oxford University's chair of poetry, you see, famous city. And But what has happened is that he is using, he is in this poem to in digging, I am sure that you have this poem with you, and you can read this poem. He says, my father was different, he was a very strong man, there is great admiration of the poet for his father, for his ancestors there. But in his generation, he has come away from there. And he is the plow, the spade in his hand, has shrunken into a pain. Into a pain. And a pain has become the first term of the binary now. More respectable. And the father, and he says his, his father was a great worker, his muscle was like this, and he used to take this to Toner Bog and so on, you know, you remember this poem, and in that poem he's talking about this. But later on, he's talking with a kind of guilt feeling that I have to give up. I don't know why he had to give up, because 
he was a bright student. He went proceeded to Oxford University and became um, a poet laureate for a while and professor, professor of poetry. And he's a great name, and you know that Shemasin is a great poet too. You see, and he got the Nobel Prize. Uh, and so Shemasin. And so Shemasin is. What is he saying about this? And if you notice this, pen, spade, brain, soil, poetry, potatoes. So, and he's saying there that I am also doing the digging, but with the pen. So, what kind of crop am I raising? It is potatoes. It, it is poetry. And poetry has replaced potatoes. So what has happened is that the real thing, the real thing has been converted into a metaphor. Distancing from the real to the unreal, from the objective to the subjective. So this kind of displacement is what we call civilization, you see, because the more and more abstract thinking you are capable of, you are more civilized. And that's why children are less civilized and we are more civilized. Because we, are, we can be more wicked, children are not wicked. So in this way, you have this development. And so what they say is that nature is a concept by the centrists. But the kind of talk we are going through is decentering talk. You see. That we are going to say that nature is... Um, something there, out there. You can't say that if, if I say nature doesn't exist. It is there. In objective space it is nature. Whether you... But what has happened that when you don't understand nature, you... In ancient times people would worship nature as gods, deities, different deities. And we are doing the same thing. We have all kinds of speculation. The sea, another thing. The sea. The sea is the other thing. Because, you know, there's Moby Dick. Captain Ahab is pursuing Moby Dick. Why is he pursuing Moby Dick? Because Moby Dick for him represents the mask of God. If you could tear it off, he expects that he could see the face of God, the face that has been tormenting him. So he, is, he gets destroyed because it's the real ocean, you see. The real ocean. So his ideas, the obsessions, a kind of a driven man is going and then he's playing by the ocean. And what is the line? That Moby Dick, at the end of the Moby Dick, that waves are, waves are flowing as they used to flow thousands of years ago. See? And he was playing by the ocean. So, the ocean is real. So, conceptually, what is happening is that your concept is turning your brain into a kind of your own death trap. Your own entropy. And you saw that the real entropy happened after the First World War, which has been so marvelously recorded by T.S. Eliot in the Westland. And there is a beautiful line by him, the river tames, sweats, oil and tar, you see. So sweating, the ocean is sweating. Uh, the, the, sorry, the river is sweating, the water is sweating. That what is sweating then is a wild sleep you have. Now, one sleep, and if there is one sleep, life under that sleep cannot live. The organisms will die, you see. So, eventually, and you cannot really live on when the organisms around you are dying. So, what is happening is that Eliot is connecting a kind of entropy that was created by the human being and going back to swallow the creatures up, you see. So, that is the point. So, when you are studying the Echo, uh, echo critical text and echo, uh, echo writing or nature writing, you have to understand that the, what is objective reality, what is construct and what is not construct, what is true and what is a kind of speculation. So we have there a lot of, as, as uh, Michel Foucault said, about 80% to 90% of our ideas are constructed. Construct, they are not real. They, are, they have been created by language, linguistically, socially and politically created things to gain advantage one way or the other. Somehow you gain advantage of that. But these terms, these ideas are piling up in our vocabulary, you see. 
and once you have acquired them, there is no running away from them. They will come out like genie from the bottle. See, one or the other, they will come out. And what happens is that you are thinking and you are putting it away in the drawer. Then the drawer, somebody, someone, uh, some other people will open and this will come out and destroy you. So, this is, these are the entropic thoughts we create. So, for the eco critic, there is no constructedness of reality. They reject this. That, because culture has created these constructs. Culture. So, they, when you reject culture, reject this construct. So, they have to. But we understand that we cannot entirely do away with this eco critical, um, you know, this is also one sided view. Because there are certain ideas which are essential, essential, and we cannot entirely do with the concrete objects in, the, in life. We have some certain uh, abstract thinking is required there. So the next point is um, yeah, and the, and I am just going to talk to you about. Land. Land is a great place for many authors and you know that um, Hardy, Thomas Hardy, he is a very potential subject, you see, for any eco critic. You see, why? Because in him, landscape turns into a character. And once D.H. Lawrence said that the real um, cause of the tragedy of the characters in The Return of the Native is not the human action. It is the soil. Why? Look at this. The character of Eustachia Bhai. Character of Eustachia Bhai, she is a misfit there. In terms of her beauty, because she is considered uh, that with a, with a, what do you call this, with a mace, she would be the goddess on Mount, Mount Olympus. She is so beautiful. When she opened her mouth, the sun rays fall into her mouth and looks like red wine. See, she's too dazzling for the place. And she creates her own entropy there. And all the time, Ecton Hate is working to trap her. So eventually she's trapped because she does not, she's a she's a foreign body there. She's a foreign body. And so Ecton Heath cannot accept her. Cannot accept her or what you call, adapt her. So she is all the time militating against Ectonia. And so, but it's so cosmic in dimension that she gets destroyed at the end. So this is one, one point that, that the human being himself or herself can be entropy, see, can be negative, negative um, energy. That is, that's the point and Lawrence said, I just, Lawrence says, um, what is the real stuff of tragedy in the book, said? It is the heat. It is the primitive primal art where the instinctive life keeps up. Here is the deep black source from whence all these little contents of lives are drawn. Then says, this constant revelation in Hardy's novels, that there exists a great background, vital and vivid, which matters more than the people who move upon it. Against the background of dark, passionate action of the leafy, sappy passion and sentiment of the woodlands, of the unfathomed stars, is drawn the lesser schemes of life, lives, the vast, unexplored morality of life itself. What we call the immorality of nature surrounds us in this eternal incomprehensibility. That is the thing that we are talking about, that I was talking about depraved nature, you see. That nature, that to be natural is to be depraved. But he's talking about that. That is incomprehensibility. That surrounds us in its eternal incomprehensibility. And in its midst goes on the human morality play. Human morality play goes on within this immorality play of the Hector and Hate, you see. And it is so huge. Its dimension is so huge that human drama can keep up with the pace of Hector Hill. See, you have seen that how Hector has been described. That time hardly moves in a See, and 
there is a kind of darkness there, which is... And the people, you know, like Thomas C. New Bright and other characters, and um, who is that? Mr. New Bright, and all these characters, they do not protest against this. They survive. But those who protest against Egton are crushed, you see. And so this is the point. And, and landscape, by definition, contains both the non-human forms and human forms, and the rocks, animals, and birds, insects, all are part of that system, ecosystem. And they uh, are related to our botanical, zoological, geological, you see, all kinds of knowledge. So if you want to handle all these things, you have to understand all these disciplines. So this is one point. And then, I am talking about this uh, Hemingway, Hemingway's writing. That Hemingway is the old man the sea. This is a very famous book and, and I have really um, chosen some books which are all familiar to you, not the unfamiliar ones. This is the familiar book and this is, this was, this received the citation as a novel by the Nobel uh, Prize Committee. And he is talking about the sympathetic relationship between the killer and the victim. You see. And he says, after catching the fish, the fish is not moving. It's a huge fish, handsome fish. And he is dying to see the size of the fish. But the fish is there. And for many days, and he has got this fish in 90 days. First, first fish in 90 days, in three months. And he says, fish, I love you and respect you very much. But I will kill you dead before the day ends. Why? Because we are caught in existential necessity. Existential circle that we are within the killing distance of each other. And one has to live on the other. That's why. But I have no enmity with you. I have kind of friendship with you. Because we are in the same boat. We are in the same human condition, you see. Though you are not human, but we are in the same condition that one has to kill to survive. So, this is the thing says. He says, yeah. It was dark now, as it becomes dark quickly after the sunsets in September. He lay against the worn wood of the bow and rested all that he could. The first stars were out. He didn't know the name of Rigel, but he saw it and knew soon they would all be out. It's a constellation. And he would have all his distant friends, his storms, his distant friends of the stars. The fish is my friend too, he says. I have never seen or heard of such a fish, but I must kill him. I'm glad we do not have to try to kill the stars. Because they are beyond my necessity. That's why. So, this kind of sadness, the relationship, this is the ethical relationship. That, that, that we are not, that when we human beings, from our anthropomorphic point of view, and why, why are we so, you see, that we have our pride, as human beings, have divine sanction. In the Bible, I have the, I just tell you where you have got the Bible lines, the Bible, have you got these lines? You can see. Very interesting, talking about, about and I was really surprised to see the language of the of the Quran is more sophisticated than the language of the Bible, you see. Bible coming earlier than the Quran, you see, is more sophisticated and because the Bible, the biblical lines are very authoritarian, very crude, as though we can hear the voice of the Arab, you know, talk. And so you have this uh, the lines, look at these lines. Look at this. Absolute authority, dominion, what you call carte blanche. You give God blush, absolute authority, give somebody to whatever you please, you see. And says that this, this is the, what call is, uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 26 in the Genesis says, And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the, over the cattle, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So, he 
the human being has got the absolute authority to do or undo, whatever please do. But when you come to the Quran, this is the, the Surah Al Isra, verse 17, that we have honored the sons, more sophisticated, more is more toned down. Said we have honored the sons of Adam, provided them with transport on land and sea, given them for sustenance things, good or pure, good and pure, and conferred on them special favors. The power of a great part of our creation. So, whether it's toned down or not, whether it's biblical or Quranic, anyway, man was given the absolute authority over the rest of the creation, the free reign. So, man has really conceived this idea of being the absolute lord of all the creation, you see. And that's why the worldview gradually has become through discourse it has become anthropocentric, anthropocentric, and people has become. So, it is very difficult thing to turn it around and make it biocentric, where you have to deal with them ethically, justly, fairly with them, not as creatures that can be destroyed. And But then, if you destroy them, if you kill them, there is a price to pay. And you see that I was talking about King Lear, in King Lear too, King Lear created his own entropy, he created his own entropy, and then he blames it on others, and look at the blasted hate on which he suffers, when he witnesses the storm scene, as we call it, the famous storm scene that comes in the examination so many times, see, the storm scene, and in the storm scene, he is really saying that, but what is the storm about, see, what is the blasted hate about? This could be the political consequences of the blasted hate which has in its turn created the abnormal atmospheric changes. Because this man, and he, he goes on and on until he is last punished and then corrected back to normalcy. And you know that how King Lear abuses nature. He abuses nature. Nature takes the punishment, you see, it gives him the punishment, what is the punishment that he suffers until and unless his punishment goes on and until and unless the starting point here for him, until and unless he recognizes the dignity of the naked man, you see, that is a turning point in the faith. So he can see that and after that he is educated, he is educated, you see. And and you see, I was talking the, as the, the poem, the snake, you have part of it, or the whole poem you have, snake, in the snake poem, uh, yes. there is a line, there is a line, when he talks about education, what is the product of, what is the gift of culture, education, and you remember that Mr. Kuj was educated in the best universities of the West, and he turned into a thug and a thief, and a, an ivory snatcher in the Congo. So, so when the, all the civilizing, so when you educate someone, you must provide him with safety, um, uh, you know, props. If those props are taken away from you, you will be the same beast again. So, Mr. Kuj was in the Congo, and his supplies were cut off, and he turned into a beast. So, which shows the vulnerability of our educational system, of education. So what is important, as Conrad once said, the, the spots on our soul, on our, in our character, that they are as indelible, as irremovable, as the spots on the skin of a leopard. You can't change them. You can't. And if you are meant to be the sewing machine, you are not expected to produce embroidery out of it. See? So human nature is like that. And so that's why once what Russell said in his autobiography about Joseph Conrad is like reading Joseph Conrad is to is like walking on a barely cool lava. You must walk in life very carefully. If you are not careful, you will suck into the magma, burning magma. So Russell understood him so very well and and Joseph Conrad has this lesson for, as we get it from Stein, the character 
of Stalin, Lord Jean, said that to Jean that don't try to swim in the ocean. Try learn how to keep afloat. See, that is the technique of living, surviving. Don't try to make an effort to overdo it. You have to. You can only live and survive if you know how to keep afloat on the ocean. So that is the point. That very stoical and very uh, what do you call very benign, very submissive, very docile way of living, not by the arrogance and pride that man is, uh, you know, famous or notorious for. And I was I was uh, talking about this poem, um, uh, saying, and there is a line, you see, and there is a it's a beautiful poem. I don't understand why this Lawrence poem poetry is not taught in the universities of Bangladesh, but he is, I think, uh, he, he will be as famous a poet as he is an artist, you see, you know, if you really give him, because I, I studied him for a while in England, the university, you see, and I saw the beauty of this university, and, and I was very surprised to see one of the great heavyweights of English literature in our uh, country wrote that this poetry is nothing, you see, so that is a, uh, very, because that is another construct. And the so, And so I was talking about in this poem, it's a beautiful poem in the sense that a snake comes. I give you the in, in brief. A snake comes, this is a very hot day. The speaker is going out to get some fresh, cool water to bring from the trough. But before he can go there, he can see a snake has come. 